welcome. I'm Yvonne Yang, and here's what happened this week. The bodies of two Chinese citizens killed when their boat collided with Taiwan's Coast Guard are back in China. That incident had further raised tensions in the Taiwan Strait and saw China increase patrols around the Taiwanese islands of Jinmen. Louis Watt reports from there. A Taoist ceremony for two dead Chinese sailors in a Taiwanese port before their bodies and their boat, a return to China. It marks a rare moment of agreement between China and Taiwan. Chinese officials traveled here to Taiwan's outlying Jinmen Islands to negotiate the repatriation of the remains of their nationals, killed in a chase with Taiwan's Coast Guard. Neither side gave details of their agreement, but reports suggest Taiwan paid thousands of U.S. dollars in compensation to the families, but without accepting blame for the incident. And from the Chinese official who traveled from a city across the water to Taiwanese land. It's a step back from where they were some five months ago, when Taiwan's Coast Guard said the sailors' unregistered speedboat was in restricted waters and that the Chinese fled from them and drowned. China called the incident malicious. Since the incident, there's been an influx of Chinese vessels, including Coast Guard vessels, in the waters around Jinmen. China, which can be seen just across the water from here, says it's simply protecting its sailors. But Taiwanese officials see it as part of a Chinese pressure campaign to get them to accept Chinese claims of sovereignty over Taiwan. The return of the bodies, while calming tensions for now, is not likely to change the continuing patrols by China in these waters, which China has sought to normalize. While this argument over the Chinese nationals and their boat has been resolved, Taiwan is left grappling with more Chinese vessels around their islands, a sign of their own restricted space and the pressure China can bring to bear. Alex Chen, Scott Huang and Louise Watt for Taiwan Plus. Japan has returned the crew of a Taiwanese fishing boat caught trespassing in its waters. But questions remain over what exactly happened. John Van Trieste has this report. After nearly two days, Japan has released the crew of this Taiwanese fishing boat. From the Japanese perspective, this is an open and shut case of illegal fishing. The ship was caught in Japan's waters, and its owner has been told to pay a guarantee of nearly 10,000 U.S. dollars to secure its eight crew members' release. But the Fishers Association at the boat's home port in Taiwan tells the story somewhat differently, although it says it doesn't have the full picture yet. Taiwanese fishers say there's nothing to worry about as long as they follow international rules. But this is already the second Taiwanese vessel Japan's Coast Guard has intercepted this month. And Japan isn't the only nation to have accused Taiwanese fishers of breaching their sovereignty in recent years. A bigger question looms as to what extent Taiwan's fishing fleet respects its neighbors. Eason Pan and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. Lawmakers from around the world have met in Taipei for the Interparliamentary Alliance on China's annual summit. IPEC is a group of leaders from dozens of countries concerned about the challenges posed by Beijing. Chris Gorin was there. The summit for the Inter-Parliamentary Alliance on China, or IPAC, is having its fourth annual conference here in Taipei. It's a group of lawmakers from around the world who say they're focused on confronting China's rise. 48 parliamentarians from 24 countries are joining, which the group says makes it the largest parliamentary delegation ever to visit Taiwan in an institutional capacity. 
Taiwan's top leaders are participating in the summit, including President Lai Qingde and Vice President Xiao Bi Kim. The group recently made headlines after it was revealed that lawmakers from at least six countries had been contacted by Chinese diplomatic staff about their trip to Taipei. They contacted the president of my political party. They asked him to, to, to stop me to travel to Taiwan, and he sent a message to them that he cannot stop me. Uh, I'm free uh, par member of parliament to make decisions. If they think that they can tell foreign legislators where they can and cannot go, they have another thing coming. These are democratically, legitimately elected legislators in different countries, and they're going to go exactly where they are entitled to go. And that's why they're coming to Taiwan, and they are not going to be told by China that they can't come here. This isn't the first time the group has dealt with Chinese pressure. The U.S. Justice Department announced earlier this year that hundreds of accounts tied to the group, including every member of IPAC in the European Union, were targeted by a Chinese state-sponsored hacking operation. Now, one of the major agenda items of this meeting is UN Resolution 2758, which gave the PRC China's seat at the United Nations and which China has used to bolster its claim of sovereignty over Taiwan. Taiwan President Lai Qingde addressed this issue in a speech during the summit, which he connected to a wider global threat. IPAC members say they want this summit to produce a plan to fight back against China's claims on this resolution. After Lai's speech, the IPAC members presented Lai with a map of Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait. All their signatures were on Taiwan's side of the map, a symbolic gesture of their solidarity with the country. These lawmakers now return to their home countries, where well, they will have to see if this global turnout marks a turning point on confronting China and whether they can turn their words into actions. Patrick Chun and Chris Gorin for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan could boost its military spending by 5% next year. Local news agency United Daily reports that the government plans to spend an all-time high of just over 19 billion U.S. dollars on defense. Taiwan's premier will submit the proposal to the legislature in August. It reportedly includes new spending on missiles and aircraft fitted with early warning radar systems. It's part of Taiwan's plans to strengthen its military to counter increasing threats from China. A planned liquefied natural gas terminal has been shelved as it awaits an environmental impact assessment. The development has renewed debates between environmentalists and the government. Tiffany Wong reports. Plans for Taiwan's fourth liquefied natural gas terminal are stalling as they once again face an environmental impact assessment. The assessment comes after years of back and forth between the city and Tai Power, the state-run company behind the plant. The mayor of Jilong, the northern port city where the LNG terminal is planned, had revoked earlier development plans in 2023, citing concerns about the impact on residents and the environment. Plans for the terminal had already been updated to address residents and environmentalist concerns after the previous mayor approved the plan. The development area shrank and was moved to a different location along the coast. But this new plan did not undergo an impact assessment. The Agriculture Ministry says the plan for the LNG terminal had already been thoroughly reviewed and overturned the city's government's decision to scrap the project. Now the terminal is up for environmental impact assessment again. Tai Power is now protesting the city's move to block the plant and is seeking the Agriculture Ministry's assistance. But environmental groups are concerned that pressure to advance Taiwan's energy supply could cause the review committee to overlook the environmental costs and move ahead with Tai Power's plan, risking permanent damage to the marine ecosystem. 
非常担心环境部在经济部的压力之下，然后当了经济部的小弟，一路帮。台电过关斩将，哈，让这个案子强行通过，这件事情是我们非常不乐见的。The Environmental Assessment Committee will meet in mid-August to discuss the plant, and environmentalists will be keeping a close eye on the proceedings as Taiwan once again works to balance its energy needs with protecting the environment. Eason Chen and Tiffany Wong for Taiwan Plus. President Lai Qingde took to social media on Thursday to throw his support behind a Taiwanese boxer competing in Paris who has been caught in the middle of a gender controversy. Lin Yuting and another Algerian competitor have been cleared to compete by the Olympic Committee despite previously failing a gender test. The decision to let them compete has triggered a furious debate online with some high-profile figures weighing in. Joyce Zen reports. After being cleared to fight for Olympic gold, 28-year-old Taiwanese boxer and two-time world champion Lin Yuting should be focusing on the competition, but is instead embroiled in another unwelcome controversy over her gender. Now that includes renowned author of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling, who's previously angered many with her outspoken stance against transgender rights. Rowling posting on X, what will it take to end this insanity? A female boxer killed? It's a reaction to the International Olympic Committee's decision to clear Ling and Algerian boxer Imani Khalif to compete after both were disqualified at the World Championships last year, having failed gender tests administered by the International Boxing Association, a federation no longer recognized by the Olympics. We all have responsibility, by the way, to try to dial down this and not turn it into some kind of witch hunt. These are regular athletes who've competed for many years in boxing. They're entirely eligible. They are women on their passports. And they, that, I think, is enough said from me. The Chinese Taipei Olympic Committee has emphasized that Lin's eligibility complies with international rules. Throughout her career, Lin has always competed as a woman and does not identify as transgender. It's a position Lin's team has maintained ever since she was stripped of her World Championship bronze medal last year, a disqualification that Lin said she had never dealt with before. While the question of whether transgender women should be allowed to compete in women's sports is fiercely debated, with critics citing safety concerns to female competitors, it's an issue that's brought invasive speculation into many female athletes and their bodies. South African sprinter and double Olympic champion Castor Semenya is still fighting a more than five-year battle in court to overturn world athletics rules that force female athletes with differences in sexual development to medically reduce natural hormone levels. My last chance winning the Olympics was 2016. <laughs> so Paris Olympics are not really my goal. My goal is more on winning my battles you know, against the authorities. It's me fighting for what's right. As for Lin, the shot to compete in Paris is a high point in her 15-year boxing career. Lin has fought among the best, including two-time British Olympic gold medalist Nicola Adams in 2016. Though Lin lost to Adams, speaking to Taiwan Plus in the lead-up to Paris, Lin described the sacrifices she's made to stay motivated to bring home Taiwan's first gold medal in the sport she loves. <laughs> And Lin's chance is coming up soon. She's the top seed in the women's 57 kilogram featherweight class in Paris, earning her a first round bye, and will take on Uzbekistan's Sitora Turdibikova on Friday. Ethan Chen and Joyce Sun for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching. Here's what happened. Follow Taiwan Plus News on social media for more of our stories. Finally, check out the summer festival fireworks at Dadao Wharf in Taipei. I'm Yvonne Yang. Take care, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>